Well, as you can see, it's important to maintain positive behaviour within a learning environment. What is a learning environment, you ask? Well, you've come to the right place. A learning environment is a broader term than classroom. Students can learn in a vast variety of settings than just a room with a desk and chalkboard. Learning environments can be physical locations, contexts, or even cultures in which students learn in. There are many different types of learning environments. Some examples are the traditional classroom, lecture halls, school trips such as museums, zoos and theme parks, the playground within state schools, private schools, faith and cultural schools, academies, forest schools, city technology colleges, state boarding schools, but they don't even need to be within schools. For instance, a learning setting could be clubs such as the scouts or dance halls, or even homeschooling would count. But a learning environment is useless, unless it's a positive one. There are many benefits of having a positive learning environment, we'll be going over five of them. A positive learning environment makes pupils feel more secure, while the opposite makes pupils inhibit more misbehaviours. Positive learning environments encourage getting along with their peers, while a negative disrupts student-to-student -student connectiveness. In positive learning environments, pupils feel more included in discussions, while in a negative learning environment, they can have difficulty in developing positive communication. Positive environments has been proven to increase student motivation, while in negative learning environments, students reported lower levels of intrinsic motivation. And finally, it's proven that positive learning environments improve learning outcomes, while the opposite is proven in negative learning environments. So now we know the advantages of having a positive environment, how do we create and maintain one? Well, first we'll need to talk about setup. According to a study in 2012, there are five main components. We'll be covering two of these at once, class size and social and spatial density. Smaller to medium sized classrooms are preferred by pupils and teachers alike, with teachers viewing class size as more important than school size. They classify medium sized as 20 to 30 pupils. The majority of teachers in this survey stated that influence was diluted in larger classes. Class size is really important so that you can teach all of them really well, especially children who don't speak English, children with special needs, your time and your attention is just dragged everywhere. Sometimes you feel that you are not teaching any of those children properly because your time is so divided. Whereas if you had 15, it would be different. Evidence shows that cramped conditions adversely affect behaviour and academic performance, and that space per child is just as important as promoting positive behaviour. Being cramped together has many negative effects, such as aggression, poor academic performance, poor social interaction and social withdrawal. With the decreasing of space between a child from 25 to 15 square feet being accompanied by the increase of aggressive behaviour. Cramped conditions have a poor negative effect on girls' academic performance but boys' classroom behaviour. However, the designs of many older school buildings make small class sizes difficult. This, added to the rapid increase of population and student-teacher ratios, make this harder to maintain, especially in big cities with high amounts of immigration and migration. Third, we have noise. Cutting down on traffic noise, such as aircraft and road traffic, can increase the memory rotation of classroom students. Classroom chattering was rated the most disturbing. Closing windows and doors, maintaining discipline and keeping the classroom relatively quiet can cut down on stress, including irritation, tension, headaches, tiredness and energy loss. Complete silence may not be desirable, however neither is excessive noise that impacts on learning. Using a device called a Yakka Tracker has proven to be a great way to control classroom noise levels. This device shows a green, yellow and red traffic light that changes based on decibel level. The teacher can set a decibel level they require and this device will display a clear and optional sound if it goes above this level. However, some will find areas that are too quiet distracting at first without the appropriate level of discipline and may feel anxiety. 
Some schools, such as cities and those near roads, will find it much harder to cut down on noise. Many teachers also use music in the classroom. When done right, this can link to increased enjoyment and academic performance. However, it's hard to scale the balance with some students finding it distracting and annoying. The fourth is light. Natural light in a classroom has also been linked to better performance and behaviour, with daylight itself being linked to higher academic performance. Students studying in daylight progress 20% quicker in maths and 26% quicker in English than those without natural light. However, gaining natural light is easier said than done, especially in our green and pleasant land. Fitting in windows to attract light while also insulating heat costs a lot of money and there just isn't enough planning in place. Which brings us nicely to the fifth and final, temperature. Sadly, the research into temperature, air quality and heating in primary schools is limited at best. However, teachers consistently quote temperature as being important to maintaining good behaviour and comfort in the classroom. There has been studies on indoor air versus fresh air, with fresh air promoting attendance, performance, well-being and health. Teachers reported students finding it harder to concentrate in the heat or just after sports and getting ill in the cold. More research needs to be put into this to be concrete. However, our common sense surely tells us that classrooms need to be middling temperature with good airflow. Sadly, in older buildings, this can be hard with money that isn't there. This has seen the rise of more outdoor teaching, such as forest schools in recent times. However, the effectiveness on this is still in debate. The clearest and most effective ways to promote positive behaviours that are proven and backed up by literature are establishing clear and predictable routines so that students aren't taken aback, using praise and encouragement frequently, at least four for every reprimand, a consistent level of difficulty in work to not be overly challenging or easy, as well as making sure students have the needed base knowledge, giving students the opportunity to speak and if they're being overly quiet, speaking to them. And finally, having clear and consistent rules that are equally applied. As we progress, we'll touch upon all of these factors. Another important thing to consider is the layout of the classroom. Together, we'll be exploring classroom displays and classroom desk arrangements. Classrooms are normally displayed in bright colours, with there being a link between self-esteem and decorating a room with students' own work. However, other evidence shows a link between bright displays and lack of attention. In highly decorated classrooms, children spend 39% on average of their time on off-topic tasks, mainly talking to their peers. In simpler classrooms with milder displays, children spent an average of 28% on off-topic activities, a difference of 11%. This could be worsened by children with autism or ADHD who get more distracted by visual displays. This evidence shows that teachers need a healthy balance of displays to promote self-esteem, these should be of children's own work, and of sensory overload to promote attention. Next, we'll be talking about desk layout. There's two parts of a desk, the chairs and the desk itself. A problem many teachers face with chairs is fidgeting. This can be distracting for others or could even cause accidents when somebody is leaning back on their chair. To avoid this, some teachers have footrests or buy special chairs with them built in. This can aid children to not fidget and improve concentration. Others choose to buy products such as bouncy bands. These are rubber footrests that allow for students to fidget with their legs to help them concentrate while not causing a distraction. Others still use a term called flexible seating. This is a progressive idea that allows for students to sit on many different types of furniture such as yoga balls and even sofas. Others choose to skip out on chairs altogether and choose to have standing desks. This is because of the health benefits, as it's unhealthy to be sitting down all day. In a survey of 1200 teachers in 2020, 68% of them stated that the classroom furniture was not suitably designed or equipped for teaching. Chairs and desks are often too high for, for the students. Unfortunately, manufacturers sell school desks and chairs based on the age of the students, but this, in my opinion, is often not appropriate. Then, the furniture is ordered in a hurry and it is not suitable for students. These alternative seating methods, however, have few studies surrounding them, so we can't know for sure the wider benefits and negatives. 
They also prove to be expensive, with school governors choosing to spend more money on what they view is more important. Some teachers prefer to keep the traditional and more academic chair and desk to retain attention and focus on the work itself. There are many different layouts of these desks that teachers choose to use, each with their own pros and cons. Here are some examples. Traditional rows, the double E, the horseshoe, pairs, paired rows, stadium, the group horseshoes, groups, clusters, and finally, circle. Because of time constraints, we'll only be exploring three of these. Traditional rows, clusters, and circle. A study in 1985 measured the behaviour in relation to these layouts. The first positive behaviour is listening during class. Rows scored an average of 11.85, clustered scored an average of 11.72, and circles scored an average of 12.40. These results show that the best of these three layouts is the circle, with the worst being clusters. The second positive behaviour is hand raising. Rows scored an average of 2.82, clusters scored an average of 3.40, and circle scored an average of 2.35. This shows that the highest participation happening was with clusters, while the circles showed the lowest amount of participation. And then we have two negative behaviours. The first we'll be exploring is disruptive behaviour. Rows scored 0.62, clusters scored 0.68, and circle scored 0.69. The best layout for reducing disruptive behaviour was rows, while the worst was circle. And finally we have withdrawal. Rows scored 3.54, clusters scored 2.43, and circle scored 2.97. So the best layout to make children feel less withdrawn is circle, while the worst is rows. As you can see, desk layouts may not be so simple as saying one type is best. Instead, adapt around your current students to best suit them and your own teaching style. Your teaching style is something you'll need to work out on your own over time, but there are eight main theories of teaching. These are cognitive, behaviorism, constructivism, humanism, connectivism, transformative, social, and experiential. Cognitive focuses on how people think. It's one of the oldest and proving learning theories. It focuses on a teacher-led internal approach. Teachers allow for their students to ask questions while they lead the lesson. They allow for their students to think, share ideas, and most importantly, fail. They give students tasks and let them get on with it, while allowing them to ask for support if needed. This theory focuses less on what students are actually doing, instead focusing on helping them retain knowledge, such as allowing for students to have a discussion and reflect on their own experiences, asking students to explain their reasoning, and showing students how to do something before letting them do it. The negatives of this is that some students may not have the confidence or social skills to involve themselves. It is much less supportive and stricter than other theories, and may not suit some students. It relies on the teacher having a strong knowledge base and having good communication. Behaviorism focuses more on the external than internal. Teachers who adopt this style give positive reinforcement and reward good behavior. This theory is often most helpful to those with learning difficulties. Teachers lead by example and set out the behavior that they want to encourage. Some examples of this theory in use are using gestures or sounds when wanting a room to be quiet and for students to listen, giving out rewards for positive behaviour such as stickers, and being a good role model, portraying how you want others to act. This however may not work on students that lack intrinsic motivation. Older students may not care about cheap rewards and therefore this can get expensive and it will also require students to have emotional intelligence. Constructivism is a theory that suggests that students create their own learning. Teachers start upon the student's previous knowledge and then build upon it. This theory is most helpful if aiming for a more person-centered approach, as it allows for students to take a more active role in their own learning. Some examples of this is giving students goals and allowing them to achieve it how they like laying out a classroom to focus on more self-directed learning, and generally giving students more options into how they study. 
The main negatives of this theory is that it's much harder for students with less foundation knowledge, making it much harder to differentiate between all students' knowledge bases. And some students will lack discipline and be unable to direct themselves. Humanism is very closely tied to constructivism. This theory prioritizes self-actualization on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Teachers will help maintain a positive environment and attempt to meet all of their students' needs. This theory is most commonly used in SEND schools and deprived areas. Some examples of this use in practice is by having a safe place, providing free food and water in the classroom or school, and generally making students feel comfortable. An extreme example of this would be allowing students to have a nap at school. The main negative of this is that it will cost more money and resources if students are from a more deprived background. Some students will take advantage of this and do much less work. On wider levels, such as free school meals, it requires a tax increase in order to pay for that. And finally, some students will require more needs than the teacher can actually give them. Connectivism is the newest widely accepted learning theory. This theory suggests that students learn through experiences, such as joining clubs, family, friends and hobbies. Teachers who adopt this theory will prioritise getting to know their students on an individual basis and forming a good rapport with them. They will attempt to motivate their students and encourage them. Some examples of connectivism in action is by allowing for students to sit in groups and allowing them to talk to their friends building up a professional relationship with students and encouraging them to develop the skills that they enjoy. This will, however, require students to have either intrinsic or extrinsic motivation. Some students may just not like the teacher, a personality clash or barrier, or finally, students may be distracted by their friends or have bad role models. Transformative is a theory based on feeding students new knowledge to change how they process information. It's focused on changing approaches, helping students to reflect on their past experiences, helping students develop a more critical mindset and manoeuvre their barriers. Some examples of this is by getting students to think about their past failures and how they can negotiate them, or getting them to talk openly about their feelings. The negatives to this is that it's aimed more at adult learners and requires them to have emotional intelligence. This will also need to be paired with at least one other learning theory. Social learning theory is similar to behaviourism. It's based around pupils mimicking positive behaviour. This theory is most helpful for students who are disruptive or lack attention. It has a focus on giving examples of positive and negative behaviour and encouraging the students to mimic the positives. This theory relies on a student seeing something happen in front of them and then copying that behaviour. Examples of how this could be used is by getting their peers to display and act out positive behaviour, promoting friendships with students who already exhibit positive behaviour, or the teacher themselves exhibiting positive behaviour. This theory requires the social intelligence of its students. They must also be impressionable for this to work, and there may also be personality clashes within the classroom. And finally, we have experiential. This theory promotes learning through experience. It promotes active experimentation and hands-on experiences. It requires children to plan ahead and then review if their planning was correct. Some examples of this is taking students out on school trips, allowing students to do science experiments, and generally giving children more practical tasks. The negatives of this is that it can be expensive to buy resources and to take them out on trips. Some students may find it challenging to feel unsafe. It may require much more staff depending on class size and it also obviously involves safeguarding risks. Remember that these are by no means all of the theories, only the main ones, and that more or even all of them can be used at once. Your personality and own behaviour will also affect that of your class. Remember to demand respect in your classroom. You are the authority. However, this respect needs to be earned and can be lost easily. Be prepared, in 2005 it was estimated that around 80% of disruptive behaviour was down to poor classroom management, organisation and planning. Plan ahead for behaviour that challenges, such as taking away all phones before they become a distraction. Act professional, dress smart, show up on time, use appropriate language and everything else you'd expect from another professional. Display a good knowledge of what you're teaching, show students that you know what you're talking about and why this knowledge is useful. 
Giving students constructed feedback on work has been proven to increase self-reflection and boost teacher-student relationships drastically, even in cases where the feedback wasn't all positive. It also changes the way that students think about their behaviour to revolve around their own work rather than just thinking about themselves of being a nuisance. Having a seating plan is proven to be one of the best ways to manage behaviour. This can help develop friendships such as putting introverts next to extroverts, splitting two people up who dislike or play up together and shows that you're in control of the class and this can be changed when needed. Ensure that you maintain professional boundaries. As much as we all love children and want to be that cool teacher we had years ago, ask yourself what's more important, that your students like you or that they're learning. Children need boundaries and you must be the adult in the room. Of course you should be kind and courteous towards your students and hopefully you'll grow to like each other. But never forget you're responsible for their education. Be a teacher, not a friend. So what's the best way to build these professional relationships? Well, disrupted behaviour's most common cause has been found to be low quality teacher-student relations. So improving these relations is one of the best things you can do as a teacher to increase positive behaviour and learning. Get to know your students. Using cliche icebreakers is a good method, but also join in, don't just observe. Introduce yourself and start conversations with your students using small talk. Get to know them while keeping conversations private, simple and appropriate for the age range. Remember to maintain positive body language while doing this. Doing this will help build trust and rapport, but this also needs to be maintained, so remember your students. Remember their names and keep dialogue open and friendly. Doing this scored a mean of 3.39 in a study in 2016, an increase of 0.15 of increasing control of the classroom. Remember to talk about them as much as possible. Don't bring your own life into the classroom or let it affect your teaching. We all have troubles and nobody expects you to be 100% every day, but they do expect professionalism. Ensure that you motivate your learners. Being cheerful and enthusiastic about your subjects is a must. If you find what you're teaching is boring, how do you expect the students to feel? If you show great passion and love for what you're teaching, this can rub off on students and set them on the right path and increase their motivation for learning in life. Students with intrinsic motivation may need to be reminded and encouraged every so often when they're having a bad time. The real task is attempting to motivate those who lack it. You must help these develop extrinsic motivation to avoid them zoning out or getting bored. The most common way of doing this is by offering rewards. A study into token economies measured that giving students tokens for good behaviour that they can then trade for low cost rewards is a great way to teach life skills and increases motivation. By using tickets as these tokens, you can even write down their name and what they did to earn the token, giving them praise at the same time. This however takes time and can get expensive. A cheaper way of doing this is with a mystery box. Have their tickets be used as how many chances they get for drawing a prize in a raffle-like system. This will lower the cost substantially but will not be as motivative. Even cheaper options are pen licenses or even just stickers. Some students thrive from discipline, especially those with poor home lives or deprived areas. Having your learning environment be that stable place of discipline may help them build intrinsic motivation. Aim high for these students and don't give up on them. Doing this is called a disciplinary behaviour management approach. This is when there's strict and clear rules that the school must follow on a school-wide approach. These rules must be both clear and consistent, with a disciplinary approach being proactive. Students will then face sanctions if they fail to abide by these rules, and this will be escalated. A study in 2004 shows that using a step system to enforce these rules is the most effective. In contrast, requiring students to do extra work and sending them off to another teacher is proven to be the least effective. In these schools, senior staff normally take a more active role in discipline, patrolling the school and making their presence known. This is both to enforce the rules and to make students take notice. The positives of a more disciplinary approach is that students focus more on grades and their work. The schools using this method having greater achievement levels. This method also helps crack down on some students in more deprived and disadvantaged areas who lack wider discipline outside of school. Evidence shows that when using this approach on disadvantaged students, 20% of them are able to catch up and improve on their grades. 
with disadvantaged learners being the greatest beneficiaries from it. However, this approach may not work for everybody. Some may feel overwhelmed by the discipline if they're not used to it, with some parents not wanting their children to go to such a strict school, instead preferring their children to enjoy their youth and be more social. If a disciplinary approach is not implemented correctly with strong leadership, it could have much worse effects. The opposite of this approach would be a reactive behaviour management restorative practice scheme. This approach is growing in popularity quickly, with 87 to 90% of teachers willing to give it a shot, while in the USA, 41.6% of schools already report using it. This is when the victim and perpetrator talk it out when something goes awry. In this method, the teacher takes a more background approach. They sit both the children down and gauge their feelings. They ask the victim in private what they hope to gain from teacher involvement while offering emotional support. They will then sit the perpetrator down in private and ask them why they did what they did, attempting to put them in the other person's shoes. This will end with both children being placed in a room together to talk it out, with the teacher acting as a calm influencer and steering the conversation to a positive resolvement. This method also helps build strong relationships with the teacher. It also shows to decrease suspensions on an average of 16%, but in some schools it lowers as much as 87%. It's also proven to increase student involvement in their own education, boosting peer-to-peer -peer relationships. However, it makes the teacher act as a judge and respect both sides. It may also lead to a lack of discipline, with restorative practice proven to be needed to be backed up with a wider disciplinary approach for best results. This system also may not work in extreme situations, and it doesn't really reflect the real world. Both of these methods could be used in conjunction to best fit a middle ground, setting out a clear disciplinary approach while attempting to resolve situations in a more restorative way to allow students more freedom. Michaela Academy School is considered to be the strictest in Britain. Children aren't allowed to talk in hallways. It focuses directly on the academic Students sit in traditional rows with the teacher leading up front and has strict uniform rules. To enforce all of this, they use a disciplinary approach. Mahala Community School has clear and effective rules. This is another example of proactive behaviour management. The pros of this is that there's no grey area, with students having a clear standpoint. They also have the opportunity to be mature and accountable, and everybody knows what the rules are and are on equal footing. The cons of this is that it may make the schools seem more unfun with teachers limiting learning. These rules also need to be consistent or students will misunderstand. In contrast, Summerhill School is considered to be the most progressive in Britain. Lessons are optional. Teachers and students are considered equal in terms of authority. They offer many extracurriculum subjects, not just the academic, and have no uniform requirements. They instead use restorative practice to encourage positive behaviour. Summerhill has an environment of positive reinforcement. This is another example of reactive behaviour management, as they're reactively encouraging their students to portray positive behaviour. This helps students understand what positive and negative behaviour is and the repercussions of it, and it's also proven to boost motivation. However, this method may not work on all students and requires excellent student-teacher relationships. Which school do you think had better results academically? These results are even more astounding when you realise that Michaela's school is from a deprived area with many disadvantaged students, while the opposite could be said about those students at Summerhill. Those who went to Summerhill school, however, stated that the moral and spiritual lessons they learned while at school, as well as the relationships that they formed, were much more important. This also isn't proof that all progressive education methods are failures, as this is just an extreme example. However, it does prove that when in doubt, the traditional teaching methods both work and are effective. So now we know how to encourage positive behaviour, but what happens when this fails and disruptive behaviour does take place? Well, there are two types of disruption, low level and high level. High level disruption, such as fighting, is what most people think of. However, low level disruption is much more common and therefore just as important to clamp down on. Some examples of low level disruption are looking out the window, passing notes, not putting their hand up, chatting and general lack of self-control. 
failing to combat this will result in your lesson being slowly eroded away. Stopping and shutting down this behaviour whenever it occurs can take up as much as one third of your teaching time. However, some teachers do choose to postpone countering this behaviour as it's happening. This will deprive attention seekers and not interrupt your teaching as much. However, it's important not to ignore this behaviour. Ensure you address it and give reprimands for it in your own time, such as during break time or when other students are getting on with their work. High level disruptions, although much rarer, are much more severe to deal with. Your rules and expectations must be set out as you meet your students, whether it's talking to them as a whole class or something that's stuck in their books or on the wall. Students need to understand these rules. Don't just expect them to know what they are and what you expect. And of course, follow these rules yourself. Be strict with these rules, with warnings at first. If warnings don't work, then there will need to be a sanction. Sanctions like the rules need to be fair, consistent and proportionate. Be firm, but fair. These may not work at first, but helping students learn discipline is a must for their education, so keep it up and don't give up. Students will hope that you will. Have patience and emotional intelligence. If things turn for the worse, don't get into an argument. De-escalate, de-escalate, de-escalate. If needed, go higher up the food chain, such as the head teacher. They're there to help. You're not alone and only as strong as your support network. There is a hierarchy of adults to support and enforce these rules, from department heads to management. This may not always be an option if you work in a disorganised or unsupportive environment. However, hopefully, this won't be the case. Getting parents involved may also help. Most parents care about their child's education. Remember to remain calm. Your job as a teacher is not only about teaching, it's also about maintaining a positive learning environment, and therefore the good behaviour of your students. Don't get emotional, don't get angry, cry or storm out. Keep a stiff upper lip, remain calm and remember, de-escalate, de-escalate, de-escalate. These situations should be prevented, but to know how to prevent, we must first understand the underlying causes of behaviour that challenges. There are many underlying causes of behaviour problems, so it's important not to judge a book by its cover. Some of these could include bad role models, negative past experiences and trauma, poverty, bullying both in and outside of the learning setting, negative peer pressure, social media and internet influences, puberty and going through phases, general attention seeking, problems at home, grooming and indoctrination, a lack of motivation, fear of failure, bad teaching or the lack of teacher confidence, the lack of inclusivity within the learning setting, the lack of a support network, drugs and other addiction problems, a badly set out learning environment, or undiagnosed and unrecognised difficulties. A child may have any number of these all going on at once that will negatively affect their behaviour. Let's discuss quickly three of these as an example. Poverty, problems at home and undiagnosed difficulties. First, let's discuss problems at home. There is a major proven connection between getting suspended from school and children who state they have problems in their home life. Some of the reasons mentioned were a death in the family, arguments and separation or general family drama. This reason is stated much more by males who get suspended more than twice as much as females on a factor of 16.42 compared to 5.71. There is also a clear connection between students portraying antisocial behaviour and their parental lack of education, attainment and background. This overlaps with the second reason we're discussing, poverty. If children have a deficiency of needs such as substance, shelter, clothing, warmth and sleep, it will affect their feelings of safety, belonging and lower their self-esteem. There's a clear link between antisocial behaviour and children whose families collect welfare and use food stamps. It's also proven that children who collect benefits such as free school meals or equipment from the government state that they have lower school commitments. This is worsened if they have a negative teacher relationship. For example, if you own a pencil and it's your own pencil, you'll look after it. But if the pencil's just given to you, then there's no incentive to look after it. And finally, we'll be discussing quickly an undiagnosed learning difficulty. Children with learning difficulties are more likely to be excluded from our education system. For instance, 20% of parents whose children have autism say that they have been excluded from school. While two in five of children with autism say that they have felt unincluded in the learning environment informally. 
until the last 10 years, many children went through the whole education system before being diagnosed with autism as adults. Just using autism as one example shows the severity of needing to help and support those with SEND needs.